Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're only four days away from the 12th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Centers in New York. And we have been witnessing over the last several months some of the most treacherous uh, tyranny and, and uh, traitorous behavior of our president and its entire administration uh, concocting stories to go to war the lie about Assad using chemical weapons. Um, it, it, for God's sake, on YouTube, you can go see the guy that deployed the weapons. He's Al-Qaeda, and he's bragging about it on YouTube. For That's just one of the, the clues. But it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, you know what the deal is? In the old days, they used to do one of these false flag attacks only once a generation. So every generation could be properly shocked and manipulated, and they'd get away with that. But 9-11 was a wake-up call. That false flag didn't really fly. Too many people saw right through it, and now the world, the world is seeing through it. Um, ever since 9-11, they have given us a steady stream of false flag attacks so steady that it's obvious it's easy for us to spot them now they can't get away with them anymore the boston bombing is a great example of that they were about to blame it on you know local domestic militias and then an info warrior from the alex jones show questioned the authorities in the middle of the uh press conference. They actually shut down three press conferences because they didn't want to get the questions out. And his question was, you know, isn't this a false flag attack? Look at these pictures. Well, so the Syria thing is another false flag attack. But my God, this time the war that is going to result is going to be a nuclear war. And we've got some really breaking news here. Um, it's, a, it's amazing. How can... Senator Lindsey Graham has said, if we don't attack Syria, we can expect a nuclear bomb to go off in Charleston Harbor, or is that what it, North Car or South Carolina? My God, I mean, how, how does he know? Anyway, we're going to start out right away with this one clip. Folks, this is the most dangerous time that we've probably ever experienced in the history of our country. Well, if they're ready, go ahead and play this one. I'm Anthony Gucciardi, and last Tuesday, myself and Alex Jones delivered an exclusive report on super high-level military intelligence that revealed to us there was a black ops-style, unsigned nuclear warhead transfer going on from Dias Air Force Base in Texas to South Carolina. That's all we were told. This is a credible source. We were very concerned. Yesterday night, we got a news tip through the news tip option on our websites, that Lindsey Graham had come out and said that if we don't attack Syria, he expects, he fears, and he warns that a nuclear attack could be carried out in South Carolina through some type of boat or something like that. That immediately, when I read that, my heart was pounding. We came out with this news. We are actually a little scared. This is the most important thing we may have covered in recent years. And Lindsey Graham is now warning of this nuclear attack. What I'm going to do today is I already called Dias Air Force Base. They gave me the runaround, told me to call back, told me they were going to call me back as soon as they could. They never called me back. We're going to call not only Dias Air Force Base and set the record straight, we're going to contact Lindsey Graham in his office, and we are going to ask for answers immediately. We're looking at a potential uh, nuclear attack in the United States, potentially carried out by the U.S. government or elements of the rogue government inside the U.S. government, taking these nuclear weapons or whoever took them from Texas delivering them to South Carolina. This is an exclusive, a massive bombshell report. We're going to call them right now. Public Affairs, Captain Gillibo. Hey, how's it going? My name's Anthony Gucciardi. I just wanted to ask you a couple questions if you have the time. Sure. 
Sure, what's going on? Great, cool. So, um, well, a couple days ago on Tuesday, we received intelligence reports and a bunch of stuff we found also coinciding with people in the Dias area that there was some type of transfer going on f to South Carolina from your Air Force base. Do you know anything about that? Um, what we'll have to do here is you'll have to just let me know all of your questions, and I'm going to have to look into them, and I'm going to have to get back to you. <clears throat> well, so you want to know about some uh, weapons transfers? Well, actually, I never said anything about weapons. Um, are you aware of a weapons I'm transfer sorry. that must have gone on then? I'm just, I will, let me clarify your questions, and then I'll get them down, and we will have to get back to you. Well, I'm just wondering if there was a transfer. I didn't say anything about weapons, but was there a weapons transfer going on? It seems to indicate that you were saying there was a weapons transfer of some kind. Let me just, let me just give you a little bit about my intelligence on this subject. We know from high-level military sources that we're not going to talk about that there was indeed a nuclear warhead transfer from Dias Air Force Base. And then we do know on that same day after we got this intelligence that Lindsey Graham came out and said in a speech that if we don't attack Syria there could be a nuclear attack in South Carolina, Charleston. And I also happen to know, I also happen to know that the Dias nuclear warheads were being transferred to South Carolina. Is there a question there, Anthony? I am wondering was there a transfer of any type of weapons as you seem to have indicated on this is a serious this is a serious thing if there are nuclear warheads coming from Dias Air Force Base to South Carolina and then Lindsey Graham comes out and says if we don't attack Syria then terrorists are going to blow up South Carolina Charleston it's a big deal I, I actually originally called you on Tuesday and it was kinda just a little funny thing like you know I know you wouldn't tell me anything but this is actually a serious thing we're talking about a nuclear issue here Okay. Well, uh, like I said before, if you just give me your questions and That's I That's my question. Was there a nuclear was there a transfer of any kind? I asked if there was a transfer, you seem to acknowledge okay. that there might have been a weapons transfer. Was there a weapons transfer of any kind going on you, to South Carolina? Do you have a number or an email that I can uh, get back with? Well you? you have my number. I called you before. You said you would call me back in a timely manner and there was no call back and I don't think you're ever going to call me back. Okay. Oh, I think that was somebody else in my office, and I don't believe you left a number with them. Well, we left the number. We left the okay. number. Okay, so will you please get to me again? Sure, we'll give you a number. So when are you guys going to give me a call back with some answers? Um, we can probably get back to you by the end of the day, and you are just looking for the question that I have right now, was there a transfer? Was there a transfer of any kind to South Carolina? Mm -hmm. Second question, does Dias Air Force Base admittedly have nuclear weapons? Third question, are you aware of the fact that Lindsey Graham said there might be a nuclear attack in South Carolina? Fourth question, if there was a transfer, I'm where sorry, was I'm it going sorry. to? Hold on, can you please slow down? Sure. Uh, I, the one I left off was, does Dias have nukes, and what was the question after that? Was the transfer going to South Carolina? Okay. And are you or any of your higher-ups concerned whatsoever? <clears throat> that Lindsey Graham says there might be a nuclear strike on South Carolina based on the intel that Dias Air Force was transporting nuclear warheads to South Carolina just hours before he came out and said that. Yeah, we'd really appreciate you calling us back today. And uh, please, as soon as you physically can do so, please give us a call back. Okay, we will look into the answers and we will get back with you. Do you have an email address that works? Anthony at Infowars.com. I just want to ask you one question on a personal basis. Does it trouble you that there is intel of nuclear warheads coming from Dias hours before Lindsey Graham says that there could be a nuclear strike from terrorists in South Carolina if we don't go to war with Syria? Does that trouble you? Again, Anthony, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to get back with you on these answers. Okay, well, we'll talk with you later today. We'll be expecting the call. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Well, expecting the call and getting the call are two different things, and of course they didn't get their call. Um, but this is really awesome. If, if, if there's a nuke that blows up somewhere, you know that it was another false flag. I mean, nobody has these nukes except us. If, if, somebody, if some terrorist gets it, it's because we gave it to them. That's what uh, the assassination of the ambassador was all about. They gave those Stinger missiles to Al Qaeda. Oh, it this is just amazing. It, but okay.
let's move on. Something positive has happened. The 2013 Whistleblower Award has been awarded to Snowden. That's right. And, of course, he's not available for comment. So how about uh, Glenn Greenwald? He does a great job. So here's Glenn Greenwald on behalf of Mr. Snowden. I'm delighted to be able to speak about the whistleblower award that has been given to Edward Snowden. If I were on the committee making the choice of who is to receive this award, it would take me probably one and a half seconds at most to have come to the conclusion that he's the only person deserving of this award for this year because he really does embody whistleblowing in its purest and most noble form. There's a lot of debate about what whistleblowing means, what exactly the attributes are that defines it. And I've written a lot about whistleblowing and have thought a lot about it. And I think that there's two real components to whistleblowing. One is the disclosure of wrongdoing, serious wrongdoing on the part of powerful factions. And the second one is to disclose that wrongdoing at some risk to yourself. So I think if you look at what the, the two criteria, the defining criteria are, he, he embodies both of those as, as purely as one can imagine, he exposed enormous amounts of wrongdoing on the part of the world's most powerful factions. He informed the world that there is a massive, ubiquitous spying system being constructed by the United States and its closest allies, aimed not at the terrorists or at criminals or people for whom there's evidence to suspect wrongdoing, but at all of us, people around the world. And I think the most significant revelation of what it is that he disclosed is that literally the objective of the United States and its closest allies in the UK, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia is the elimination of privacy globally, meaning the idea that there will be no ability on the part of any human beings to communicate with one another electronically without it being monitored, collected, analyzed, and stored by the United States government. One of the most profound revelations, I think, in the political landscape in some time. He also revealed enormous amounts of deceit on the part of the most senior national security officials, including deceit that is almost certainly criminal. High-level Obama officials going to the United States Congress and denying to the Congress that the NSA is doing exactly that which these revelations prove that they are doing. And so when you look at the combination of this invasive, massive spying system operating with almost no transparency or accountability and the systematic lying on the part of senior Obama uh, officials to the democratic institutions designed to check that, the amount of wrongdoing, the seriousness of it um, that he revealed to the world um, is as significant as it gets. The second attribute, which is the notion that you revealed this wrongdoing at some degree of risk to yourself, self-evidently, is something that um, Edward Snowden embodies as much as, if not more than anybody we've seen in a long time. I still remember so vividly the very first conversation I had with him in Hong Kong when I asked him whether or not he had thought about the likely consequences of his actions. And with very stoic and rational demeanor, he ticked off one after the next all of the things that he knew were likely to happen to him that have now in fact happened to him, including being charged as a criminal under the Espionage Act, an incredibly draconian law that threatens people with prison for decades, that he would be publicly branded as a traitor and someone who has gravely damaged national security, and that in essence he would become the single most wanted man in the world by the world's most powerful government. And yet he undertook this course of action knowing that all of those things were likely to happen because he told me in good conscience he could not sit by quietly and allow privacy and internet freedom to be destroyed while doing nothing about it. And he did it not only anticipating the risk, but knowing that they were almost certain to come and embracing them to such an extent that he was one of the calmest people I've ever interacted with, even as the anxiety and tension levels ought to have been through the roof given the extremity of a situation, but he was so convinced about the rightness of what he was doing that this equanimity had prevailed over him, and yet he was fully aware of the risks he was taking, and yet took it anyway for the public good, which to me is uh, uh, also as pure a whistleblower as it gets. 
Ultimately, though, I think that what will end up being most significant and most enduring about the whistleblowing of Edward Snowden is not the specific information we end up learning about what the United States and its allies are doing in destroying privacy worldwide, nor will it be the truths about the U.S. media and the world media and their relationship to political power and the way they've allowed these systems to go undetected and unreported for so many years until he had the courage to step forward. I think what will be really most enduring is the lesson that he has taught all of us, the lesson about the power of a single individual to change the world, literally, through nothing more than a powerful choice. Edward Snowden, three months ago, was as ordinary of a person as it gets. He was born into no positions of wealth or power. His parents are middle class or, or lower employees of the federal government. Uh, he had no positions of, of prestige or special access of any kind. He grew up in a lower middle class background, was just a, a low level employee of a, of a national security state when he first entered it. Um, and yet, through the choice that he made, he has literally radically transformed how we understand our relationship to political power, what the position of the United States government is vis-a-vis -vis the entire world. He has triggered massive debates all over the planet about the importance of internet freedom and privacy and the dangers and menace posed by the U.S. surveillance state. Really, a single individual who just on his own made a choice that had extreme ripple effects on all sorts of realms that I think to this day are, are still underappreciated and, and unknown. And this lesson that any individual, no matter how formidable the adversary seems, no matter how entrenched the oppressive uh, institution appears to be, can, can stand up to that institution and challenge it and shine light on it and bring about real change, I think is a lesson that all kinds of people around the world, from very young to very old, from every on every continent in the earth, will will take from this. And there will be untold numbers of people who will be inspired by the courage of Edward Snowden, by the sacrifice that he engaged in, by the principal stand that he took, by the passion and conviction that drove him to do what he did. And it very well may be the case that of all the impact that his conduct ends up having, what he actually ends up revealing will be a small part historically of what we end up learning when we look at all the people who end up inspired by him to come forward and journalists who end up unafraid to challenge the world's most powerful factions, people being willing to risk all sorts of public smear campaigns and threats of imprisonment and stigmatization and demonization because they saw that Edward Snowden and the people who worked with him were willing to endure that and to see the enormous amounts of good that they achieved in deciding that they too are willing to do it. So it isn't just the whistleblowing or the risk that he undertook personally that I think will be the most enduring impact of what it is that he did. I think it will be the template that he created, the inspiration that he provided for other people all over the world in all kinds of different realms to do the same. And I think the reason to award whistleblowing and to honor it and to give an award to whistleblowing isn't merely to give that individual the recognition that they are due, but also to send a signal to the world that whistleblowing is something that we honor and that we celebrate because of its incredibly potent and, and consequential impact on, on the rest of the world. And there's clearly nobody who has vividly illustrated the impact of whistleblowing as potently as he has certainly this year and, and probably for many, many years. So I think this was an extremely brave, but also a very meritorious selection. Um, and I'm very happy that the Federation and that this group had the courage to name him this. And I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that this award went to the person who clearly most deserves it for this year, Edward Snowden. Thanks very much for listening and for asking me to share with you some of my thoughts tonight. Right on. I thought that was a real positive feature there, and everybody needs to be encouraged. Um, they're really cracking down hard, but everybody has a camera. Always carry it with you and keep it ready, and don't be afraid to just shoot, shoot, shoot. You'll be able to capture something, no matter how insignificant you think it is, it might turn out to be important. Well, um, I'm going to try to fit a lot of stuff in. We've got the 9-11 anniversary coming up in four days, and I have a, uh, 
a three-hour presentation by Barbara Honiger. Um, it's kind of controversial because some of the 9-11 group thinks that she shouldn't be allowed in, and the other part thinks, wow, she's great. And uh, I got, got caught in the middle. I have to do my homework before I can tell you, you know, how bad I got stuck or if I did. Um, but in the meantime, check out uh, channel, it's 22 or 23, at 830 on 9-11, 8.30 a.m. on 9-11 for three hours. Set your tape recorders. I'll give you some other times later in the show. Right now, we're going to go to um, a, a clip that's an excerpt from a movie called Counterintelligence. It's a one of those six-part movies. Each part is an hour or more. Um, but this little clip is a good one. It's uh, uh, got one of my favorite people, Michael Parenti. Uh, see how you like it. This is a great one. How much would you attribute the increase in conspiratorial thinking to that red line? There has been an explosion of conspiracy theories flying fast and furious over the internet. Those conspiracy people, a lot of the conspiracy theories, of course not a lot of conspiracy theory, goes back to the Bush era. I'm Jesse Ventura, and this is Conspiracy Theory. Well, conspiracy mongering. Fringe conspiracy theorists. Conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theorists. The people who foment conspiracy theories, crazy conspiracy theories, full-blown American conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories are a great American pastime. And not all of them are on the right. There's plenty on the left as well. Never told a soul about it. In fact, they engaged in a vast conspiracy. Since you get accused of being a conspiracy theorist, a speculation, conspiracy theories. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. Painting this type of picture only feeds the delusions of those who wear tinfoil hats around their house. You know, there have always been crazy people who gravitate, if they have schizophrenia, who gravitate toward conspiracy theories. Those true believers in the mystic power of New Age crystals, spirit channeling, of people who talk to trees. Now, I don't consider myself a conspiracy buff at all, but when they get a lot of coincidences, I get a little suspicious. How does this term conspiracy theory get used, and what are what are the purposes that it's used for? It, conspiracy theory is a little bit like the word uh, propaganda, and it's used specifically to discredit someone and to say, in effect, you're nuts. You're making it up, or you don't know the you know you don't have knowledge about this, or that you're irrational. That's that's the description of a conspiracy theory. So. That is a very effective way, uh, and frequently used in the mass media and by media commentators and reporters, uh, as a means of discrediting points of view that they, they don't agree with. Conspiracy theory is a term that's used whenever anybody ascribes conscious intent to people with power. So I can say to you that school teachers are concerned about their salaries and they're organizing and they're threatening a strike and they're pressuring. I can say to you that farmers are doing this and looking for subsidies and, and, and facing certain policies. But the minute I say to you that the very people at the top, the plutocracy, the very rich and powerful, the ones who own most of America, that they are consciously pursuing power and wealth Someone will come along and say, what do you have, a conspiracy theory? Or they'll say, oh, you're cynical or you're paranoid. Their view is that stuff just happens. Things just happen, unintended consequences, or our leaders are stupid and they're jerks or they're confused and they don't know any better. And, of course, the critic knows much better than everybody else. People who operate in this world operate with intent, uh, there, there's no such thing as imperialism without imperialists. There's no such thing as capitalism without capitalists. There's no such thing as rulers who are somnambulists who walk around in their sleep. You watch out for your interests. You watch out and you make ca calculations. What makes you think that David Rockefeller doesn't? What makes you think that the, the people at the top don't do it? And what makes you think they don't collude and organize? Or what do you think you have a group of 
people who sit around in a room and they plan this. And I always say, oh no, God, they don't sit around in a room. They meet on carousels and they go up and down merry-go-rounds or they meet skydiving and they hold hands and they argue. Of course they sit in rooms. Where the hell else are they going to meet? Popular usage of the term conspiracy theory does not appear to closely correlate with evidence in support of a particular assertion. British Prime Minister Tony Blair dismissed the idea that the invasion of Iraq may have been motivated by oil as an absurd conspiracy theory. In fact, the most absurd conspiracy theories are often promoted by the most powerful individuals in society, including Tony Blair himself. His claim that Iraq had retained massive amounts of chemical and biological weapons and was plotting with Al-Qaeda to attack the West had zero evidentiary support. The Third Reich promoted the conspiracy theory that Jews were responsible for most of the world's ills. During the Cold War, American policy planners claimed that the Kremlin was engaged in a worldwide communist conspiracy, even while their own intelligence reports suggested the opposite. More recently, Muslims have become the primary scapegoat. In 2008, the John McCain presidential campaign mailed out 28 million copies of the pseudo-documentary Obsession a hate film suggesting that Muslims are engaged in a massive conspiracy to create a worldwide Islamic dictatorship. On the populist right, macro-conspiracy theories are often used to deflect attention from class analysis while encouraging scapegoating. These are the big players in the world right now on the things that are, are, are happening. Big education is fundamentally involved in everything that is happening. Soros, the Tides Foundation, Open Society, Anonymous is now starting to take a big role, SCIU and AFL-CIO, Russia and Putin is now in control. I remember I said that about eight years ago, and I said Putin's going to, he's going to come roaring back. Oh, that's crazy. Don't, yeah, really. Here's Occupy Wall Street, Islamic extremism, Iran, the White House, and the media. These are all the real players that are causing so many problems um, right now. What's a conspiracy? And what, um, to what is everything that somebody says happened? Does that mean that that's actually happened? Some of the stuff that people believe about uh, the CIA or the national security state or Jews or black people or Wall Street or, you know, you name it, liberal media right-wing media. Some of the things that people believe about all of those controversial things are not true. And so we get into a situation in which the accusation that a conspiracy exists or th that there's a plan afoot to do something becomes a powerful political tool. One of the most powerful tools of propaganda is rumors rumor mongering and uh, it one can see it even in elections you can see it in international affairs and so forth if rumors appeal to people's primal fears fears about race fears about gender fears about their own relationship b between themselves and, and authority those sorts of things and there are plenty of people out there who will exploit those fears and it's quite difficult for ordinary people who are living their lives to card out well, what is just nonsense from what is incredible yet real. There's no simple solution to this problem. Present day media tends to encourage people to believe in nonsense by giving credibility to it on the one hand and on the other hand, oftentimes, not always, uh, denying the reality of evidence that is substantial. I think that the way to get at this in, in a social sense is to keep an open mind, investigate carefully, 
and not to believe in stuff that you don't understand. We as scholars, or teachers, media people, just as ordinary citizens, should not propagate stuff that they don't understand or that they don't have factual support for. Now, the term conspiracy theory is a very interesting one. Uh, it is, of course, applied to almost anything that's perceived as threatening, any kind of broader attempt to explain, explain specific events. There certainly are people and elements out there that create these explanations for everything, and those are potentially dangerous because they do lead to scapegoating. Uh, on the other hand, there are actual people, actual covert operations, actual things happening that we don't know about, and it's very, very important to understand them. I mean, they are fundamentally conspiracies, which simply means uh, uh, several people colluding in a secret and uh, illegal operation. Conspiracies are prosecuted every day in the courtrooms of this country, uh, and theory is what we use to try to understand things. So uh, I find the term conspiracy theory a broad brush pejorative, which I think is designed to suppress discussion. I do think we need to distinguish between those who see a bogeyman everywhere and those who do careful research and come to the conclusion in particular cases that there was some sort of an organized effort to do something, perhaps to remove a president uh, or to achieve some other change uh, of which the public uh, was never informed. If you're going to look and say, it, you know, it's, uh, it's structures and systems that run the world, you have to realize that there are trap doors in these uh, structures and systems and that not all of the structure not all of the system is visible in the public record. And that's where we come back to what I say about deep politics and a deep state. We have to acknowledge that there are processes going on that are not finding their way straight away into newspapers and history books. And it's so interesting that America can see that about other countries, uh, just has problems seeing it about itself. <laughs> Yeah, we just have problems with our own introspection. Yeah, we can't, people can't even imagine America being the worst terrorist power in the world. I mean, now, I must be some kind of a traitor to say something like that. Well, unless you consider facts mitigating, uh, exculpatory, yeah, the, the truth should set you free. But not with the NDAA and not with the Patriot Act. <laughs> the truth doesn't set anybody free. Um, remember Obama said when he first started that he was going to uh, be a champion of the whistleblowers. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, anyway, we've got a, another video right now that's uh, uh, my, one of my favorites, Amy uh, Martin. I mean, Abby Martin. I can't, a Amy Goodman. Abby Martin. Okay, Abby Martin from Russia Today, breaking the set. And she's interviewing another one of my favorites, George Galloway, the former uh, Minister of Parliament and the founder of the Respect Party. And uh, he's going to tell it the way it is about Syria and America. So let her rip. Action without even the support of his own government. Now, amidst the sea of propaganda and warmongering, there's one politician in the UK that has been a vocal opponent to this new war. His name is George Galloway, and he's a founding member of the Respect Party in Parliament. Well, earlier I spoke with him about the repercussions a military strike could have on the region as well as the rest of the world. Check it out. Sadly, my birthday wish doesn't look like it's going to come true. Uh, let's talk about the latest on Syria. There's talk of using fighter jets and training rebel forces on the ground instead of just arming them. Why is it that the U.S. is aligning itself with the same terrorist organization it claims to be fighting in the war on terror, George? Indeed, and the uh, relatives of those who were lost on 9-11, who were cruelly murdered in their thousands, must be asking themselves how their country ended up in bed with Al-Qaeda. And not just in bed, but arming them to the teeth, acting as their air force and their armorer and their financier. It is one of the most grotesque about faces in all history. And the people of the United States overwhelmingly oppose it. But their political leaders appear to be ready to endorse it. 
behind me is the British Parliament. Normally a lapdog, a poodle of American political leaders, but just the other week we revolted and stood up and said this far and no further, no war in Syria. And that too reflected overwhelmingly the popular opinion in the country. But uh, the United States has not been stopped even by the failure of the British to show up in another shooting war. Yeah, I mean, hypocrisy is running really strong, George, and I was surprised to see the criminal conspirators from doctoring the Iraq intelligence in the British Parliament vote no. It made me really happy. Uh, a lot of um, proud, proud moments there from the world leaders. Uh, and as we've seen unfold in Iraq post-occupation, there's now a complete civil war rife with sectarian violence. It's a complete disaster. Is it that the decision makers don't understand the religion and the region, or is it that they just don't care? I don't think religion has anything to do uh, with it. Religions uh, believe in the prophets, peace be upon them. Our leaders believe in the prophets and how to get a bigger piece of them. It's about domination. It's about Israel. It's about the projection of American power and the terrifying of potential rivals and competitors. In this case, principally Russia and China. I don't think that they're acting very terrified at this moment. And so the United States is in for a contested war in Syria. And that's why the congressional representatives would be wise to heed the lesson of Iraq. The United States lost thousands of soldiers and tens of thousands of wounded soldiers, maimed many of them forever, and many of them committing suicide or murdering people when they got home in the decades since. And many of them, of course, ending up on the streets homeless and jobless. And the congressional representatives ought to be aware that what will begin with a flurry of Tomahawk missiles and how obscene is it that the United States calls its killing weapons uh, after the people that it annihilated in order to occupy the country in the first place. It will start with a flurry of Tomahawk cruise missiles, but it will end in a shooting war on the ground and with an occupation and one in a country with 23 religious and ethnic groups within it, and in the most combustible possible piece of territory on the earth. The Syrian people will fight them back, Syria's friends will fight them back, and they will fight them back everywhere, not just in Syria. You know, I, I say it, it's like we're killing Syrians to show the Syrian regime that killing Syrians is wrong. I just can't wrap my head around it, George, and the stakes are very high, as you just and, outlined. Uh, well, 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 put, put Put this one in your mind, Abby. The next time you see President Obama happy clapping in a Christian church, the Al-Qaeda sacked a town called Ma'alula, which I know very well in Syria, where the people are the last people on earth still conducting their Christian services in the language of Jesus, in Aramaic. It is one of the most serene and beautiful and peaceful places on the earth, filled with Christian churches and monasteries and nunneries, and the people there were slaughtered over the last four days, literally slaughtered, with their necks, uh, their throats cut, their heads sawn off. The Christian churches are on fire at the hands of Al-Qaeda. That's Al-Qaeda, paid for and armed by the United States of America. It makes me physically ill to hear that, George, that we're actually bombing the cradle of civilization, the birthplace of humanity. We're not respecting the birthplace of Christianity in, in terms of these leaders who claim that they're Christian. George, we've both been reporting yes, that... Never done. they're never done telling us. <laughs> yeah, they're exactly. never done telling us how Christian they are. Exactly. They wear it on their sleeves. <laughs> well, you know, we've both been reporting that a British firm allegedly sold nerve gas to Syria. Let's wrap our minds around this one. Ten months after the Civil War yeah. broke out, also the Digital Journal is reporting that yeah. the Saudi intelligence gave the rebels chemical weapons. Why are these insanely contradictory facts not reported on in such a serious climate of debate? Well, we can't, we can't even get them in the British uh, so-called mainstream media. The fact that Carla Ponte, the United Nations rapporteur, in May of this year, just a few months ago, at the beginning of the summer, this summer, reported that the Syrian rebels had used the very sarin nerve gas that they're telling us now must have been used by the Assad regime. The uh, Turkish authorities captured a group of Syrian rebels making their way across the Turkish border, bearing loads of this very sarin gas. 
they're trying to pretend that you have to be a state to have your hands on sarin gas. But less than 20 years ago, a group of Shinto obscurantists living on the lip of Mount Fuji in Tokyo uh, used this gas in the Tokyo underground, killing and maiming a very large number of people in the name of Shinto. So any group, any gang, any mob of uh, gangsters can get their hands on sarin gas. And I'm absolutely convinced that the Russian President Putin is correct. I don't believe he'd be continuing to insist upon it if he had any doubt about it, that this weaponry either was an accidental discharge from the rebels' uh, stockpile or was a deliberate provocation to bring in the Western powers into this war, which, of course, as soon as President Obama drew a red line on this issue, he was openly inviting. So uh, that's one point. But the other point is this. Behind me in the British Parliament in the 1920s, Winston Churchill said this upon dropping chemical weapons on Iraqi Kurds. He said, and I quote, I don't understand what all the fuss is about, dropping gas on rebel tribesmen in the north of Iraq. We have been dropping chemical weapons on people of the so-called third world for the best part of a century. The United States dropped an ocean of chemical weapons on the people of Vietnam, and their children are still being born today deformed as a result of it. The United States used chemical weapons against the Iraqi resistance in Fallujah just a decade ago. And Israel used chemical weapons against the Palestinian people in Gaza just three years ago. The hypocrisy is monumental. It's of Everestian proportion. It's astounding, but the media George. It's simply astounding. will not report this. It's astounding. And yeah, I mean, the toxic legacy in Fallujah is even astronomically more than Hiroshima, shockingly enough. And as you said on the floor of Parliament, you said, would Assad be insane enough to launch a chemical weapons attack on the exact same day that UN weapons inspectors arrived in Damascus? And if he is that insane, what's going to happen when we do launch Tomahawk cruise missiles over the region? George, I wanted to move on to Israel. You mentioned Israel before. Right now, they are lobbying super hard on the Hill right now. APEC is going out on a full-on lobbying campaign for serious strikes. How much of this war is about Israel? Well, it's a full court press by the Israel lobby uh, in Britain and in the United States. They failed in Britain. They appear to be succeeding in the United States. And at least it unmasks a pretty monumental conspiracy. John Kerry told the world that the Arab regimes in the Persian Gulf are going to pay for this war. Israel is lobbying hard for the wall, war and getting ready for it. So we have the most grotesque coalition ever assembled in history. Al-Qaeda, the United States, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and other Persian Gulf states. Who could have made such a scenario up? But uh, be careful what you wish for, because I'm certain that Israel will be in this war big time and very quickly, because I'm certain that Syria and its friends will immediately turn the war, take the war to Israel in the first hours after the United States bombardment of Syria begins. Israel presumably will uh, retaliate and enter the war. We'll then have an Arab-Israeli war fought on top of the oil fields and uh, in the midst of one of the worst depressions that the developed world has ever seen. So look out for the oil price rocketing, perhaps quadrupling as it did in 1973-74. Look out for the Straits of Hormuz being blocked and no oil moving out of the Gulf to the world. Look out for the Suez Canal uh, being uh, blocked and attacked. Look out for war throughout the world. There's going to be murder and mayhem throughout the world. That's what happy, clappy Mr. Christian, Barack Obama, who just the other day was hailing the memory of Martin Luther King, is about to visit on the world. Well, it's a disgrace. And as Upton Sinclair said, you know, when fascism comes to America, it's going to be wrapped in an American flag and um, on a Bible, uh, George. I wanted to talk about your documentary. Uh, you just started a Kickstarter for The Killing of Tony Blair. What is this movie? And you're kind of a big deal. I'm sure you could have gotten a lot of corporate sponsors to make this film. Why go the grassroots route? Well, we wanted uh, democratic uh, funding of the film. I could have gone to a few rich people and raised a lot of money, but I decided to go to thousands 
of not rich people uh, and raise a little money from each of them. And we reached our Kickstarter, 50,000 pound, that's about, what, $70,000 uh, Kickstarter fund uh, limit. We reached it in less than one week. So we have just under 30 days to go to raise the money that we need to make the equivalent of Fahrenheit 9-11. We intend, our goal is ambitious. We intend to put Tony Blair, the Middle East peace envoy, that's going well, isn't it, Tony, in prison for crimes against humanity, for war crimes. He murdered the Labour Party. He helped murder a million people in Iraq. He has caused uncountable deaths in Afghanistan and in Lebanon and in Palestine and in Syria, where he's egging uh, Obama on for a new war. He sold his soul to the devil and sold his services to some of the most devilish corporations and dictatorships in the world. It's quite a lot of meat for a documentary. <laughs> Michael Moore, watch out. I'm coming to take your lulls. <laughs> so Tony Blair has made a killing, killing a massive amount of people, and he, like many of his criminal yes. cohorts here in the U.S., sit free while people who stand up to the system rot in prison. Seems like the system's completely upside down. We have about a minute left, George, but you are an anomaly. You've been working within the system for years. You founded the Respect Party in Parliament. How is it that you've not been pushed out of office yet? Well, I've been elected six times to Parliament. Uh, I know I'm older than I look. Uh, I was a very young man when I entered Parliament. It was a Parliament worth being a member of them. I'm not s uh, sure if it is today, uh, but I have stood uh, firm with my principles and I uh, share with Mr. Churchill the distinction of being the only two men in British history to be elected uh, six times in two countries in four different constituencies. That's where the similarity between me and Winston Churchill ends. Well, clearly the people want to hear what you have to hear. They want you to stand up for the voiceless. Thank you so much. You're a hero to me. George Galloway, Respect Pleasure. Party. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Happy birthday, Abby. <laughs> Still ahead, activists gathered in front of the White House to call attention to the force feeding happening to get more detainees. Manuel Rapolo was there, and he'll bring us the latest. The press is critical to our democracy. Respect. Guantanamo Bay. For many, it's out of sight, out of mind. But what about the dozens of innocent men being held indefinitely who have already been cleared for release years ago? Well, lately, the corporate media has been enjoying a total blackout on any news about Gitmo. But one group of activists have been consistently calling attention to the issue by holding rallies here in Washington, D.C. every week, demanding that the prison be closed. Breaking the set producer, Manuel Rapolo, got a chance to attend one of these unique demonstrations outside of the White House. Check it out. Stop the force feeding now! Demonstrators outside the White House are once again calling on the Obama administration to close Guantanamo Bay prison and end the practice of force feeding detainees that are currently on a hunger strike. The hunger strike at Guantanamo has now far surpassed 200 days. Demonstrators are here again trying to raise awareness about the plight of these prisoners. Human rights groups as well as the UN have declared the practice of force feeding a form of torture, a point being made by activist Andres Contreras, who has undergone a 61-day fast in solidarity with Gitmo prisoners. I've been fasting for 61 days on water only, some calories through coconut water, but mostly water and vitamins and minerals and salt. And I've lost 52 pounds. As part of the demonstration, Contreras underwent a nasogastric feeding right in front of the White House. Oh. This is all being done completely oh. against his will. It's an outrage. This procedure is similar to what hunger strikers at Guantanamo are forced to undergo every day and serves to highlight what life is really like for residents of the world's most controversial detention facility. What I went through today, I can't tell you. I thought it was going to be so much simpler. It was excruciating. It was absolute agony at every step of the way. I didn't know it was going to hurt so much that when he pulled it out, it was horrible. And when he put it in, it was every step was brutal. And for, and for that to happen twice a day to these prisoners is unimaginable to me. Closing Guantanamo was a main pillar of Obama's 2008 campaign, yet the facility remains open. And at nearly half a billion dollars a year to operate, Gitmo is the most expensive prison on the planet.
It's a fact not overlooked by Colonel Morris Davis, former chief prosecutor at the detention camp. I've seen different figures, but something in excess of $2 million per person per year, which federal prison here costs in the $30,000 to $35,000 per year range. So it's just a huge, huge waste of millions and millions of dollars that's unnecessary. President Obama blames Congress for standing in the way of closing Guantanamo. Others would argue that it's the administration that lacks the political will to do so. But while finger pointing continues to supersede action, dozens of men who wait for freedom wait for a day that frankly may never come. Manuel Rompolo, RT, the White House. Joining me now to talk more about Guantanamo Bay and the force feeding of these prisoners, BTS producer Manuel Rapolo. Hi, Abby. Hey, man. Um, so, yes, all this finger pointing is going on. Awesome job, by the way. But isn't it true that Obama can use national security waiver to release the prisoners? Now, right. today. No. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. Um, and th there's already been prisoners that have been released. Two Algerian prisoners were recent re recently released over the last uh, couple of weeks. President Obama can absolutely use the national security waiver. Uh, the only problem would be that he would have to do that 160 something times for each one of the of the prisoners at the very least he'd have to do it 90 something times for the prisoners that we know are innocent Who that cares? have already been cleared for release no that's great so why isn't he doing it 166 times absolutely at least for the 55 prisoners have been released not only not, not, on, not only that president obama has an ability to do so so does congress congress can can act and come up with a resolution to to find a way to get rid of to, to get these prisoners back to their home countries. There is a lack of political will. There is a lack of public support for that sort of initiative. And there's an absolute lack of media attention on, on the matter, which means that it's, it might as well be an irrelevant issue for the American people because it's not on their radar. And that's the biggest problem that we have. That's a really unfortunate. Um, let's talk about this horrific force feeding procedure. It was really hard to watch that guy. And you know, Manny, we've covered this before on the show and most deaf, the actor um, and um, rapper went through the practice on camera and people were like, oh, he's an actor, he's not really being heard. I mean, this was is your friend acting this, here? This is absolutely hard to watch, especially knowing Andres. Um, I've worked with him in activist circles in the past. Uh, he is, he lost, first of all, he lost 50 pounds yeah. off of this hunger strike. What he's undergoing, Ugh. what you're seeing right now, uh, they're using a six millimeter tube. What they use on, on Guantanamo prisoners is a 10 millimeter tube, so it's far more harsh. And that doctor that you see next to him, I had a chance to speak to him for a while, and what he was explaining is that this doesn't have to be torture. The, uh, using uh, using a nasogastric tube for feeding uh, is, is standard practice for people, you know, when, when you need to be fed. If this is not, if you are not complying to this, if you're not doing this willingly, that is torture. That is a horrible thing to do to a person. If the tube goes in too far, it can, it can pierce the brain. If it goes in too deep, it can pierce a lung. Uh, you can drown. You can get an infection from this. There are a number of risks associated when it's done correctly, let alone when somebody is fighting to yeah. not have this done and to them. We know and, this that is they are and they're doing it twice a day to these people. Twice, in, in a, day. twice a day, every twice. day, to half of these prisoners. Okay, we're going to call it short right there. I, I have enough material that I could go another hour or two. You know, every week, the same thing. I'm going to be on again next week, right after 9-11, next Saturday. Um, and in the meantime, uh, Marcella Pena from Architects and Engineers for 9-11, or Portland. Okay, you come on in and tell us. They've got a lot of stuff going on, and she's going to tell you a little bit about their plans. Hi, thanks for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the videos that have been shown so far. They've been pretty stellar. Um, <coughs> Uh, uh, Bill and I, we, we're both members of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Bill Olson, who you just saw, this is his show. Um, I co-founded the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And shortly you'll be seeing a clip um, which will show our schedule of events. Please feel free to go to portlandae911truth.org. You're not seeing the .org on the portlandae911truth.org for this schedule of events. Um, for the week of 9-11, um, which starts tomorrow and goes the entire week through next Saturday, um, we are having 14 different events um, in the Portland metro area. Um, tomorrow we're having at Beaverton, Maine and at Vancouver Library in Vancouver, Washington. Um, so tomorrow it's from 2 to 4. Please come and see the, the most recent video that we have to offer. And again, this is to, uh, this is all about showing that controlled demolition is really what brought down the three skyscrapers which came down on 9-11 in New York City. It's a complete concentration on what happened in New York City. We don't delve into the Pentagon or what happened in Pennsylvania. But, you know, we can always talk about that in the Q&A. And again, this is a schedule of events that is happening starting tomorrow all through 
through Saturday. Hopefully, maybe you even saw uh, the ad in the Oregonian yesterday. Um, but um, please do go to Portland AE 911 truthorg to see this again um, and maybe to see it with more patience and more diligence. But again, Portland AE 911 truthorg And we would love to see you. We'll be giving away free DVDs of what you will be seeing at each of these events. Um, I will be going to pretty much every single event. Um, unless it's you know double book like tomorrow is um, Vancouver and Beaverton Maine are happening at the same time, um, uh, you know so tomorrow Beaverton Maine Library uh, Vancouver Library on Monday Lake Oswego Portland Kenton Library on Tuesday Hillsborough Library Portland Hollywood Library on Wednesday Corvallis Library Portland Hills Hillsdale Library uh, Portland Midland Library Salem Central Library on Thursday uh, Clackamas Library Hood River Library McMinnville Library and on Saturday. To end it all, we're having at the Portland Central Library. Again, please come and attend if you are unaware of the possible content of the DVD. And if you are aware and you want to bring a friend or a relative or if, uh, somebody you want to get informed on the subject, please bring them. And again, we'll be giving away free DVDs of, what, of the movie that you'll be seeing, which is uh, called 9-11. Um, experts speak. Uh, actually, it's called 9/11 Explosive Evidence. Ec experts speak out. That's the name of the DVD. It just came out last year. Um, we've had the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth come to Portland once this year and twice last year. Um, and again, we'll probably be having him again next year. So you know, go to our website for upcoming events. But right now, we're having 14 events in this next coming week, starting tomorrow with two, in at the Beaverton Library and at Vancouver Library. And, um, and again, this is to show that controlled demolition really brought down the three towers, the, the three skyscrapers that came down in New York City on 9-11. The two infamous twin towers that came down in the early morning hours and the Building 7, which is World Trade Center Building 7, which came down at 5.20 later that day, which most people on the West Coast actually are not that aware of, um, unless you were tuning in that day almost the entire day. Um, so please come in. Um, we love the Q&A. After each of these events, we'll be going to a restaurant to further um, have Q&A. Um, but again, please go to our website, portland8e911truth.org, to um, see the schedule of events again and to see the addresses for the schedule of events. And we're again, we're having them through the Portland metro area, hopefully at a library near you. So thank you, and thanks for listening in. And so we're just now getting ready to roll the credits. Uh, be sure to watch the uh, uh, premiere, the Portland premiere, well, the Portland 2013 premiere <laughs> of uh, Behind, let's see, what was it? For, <laughs> it's Barbara Honiger's 8.30 oh, uh, eight, on 9-11, 8.30 in the morning. Yeah. Um, and, and she's a focus on the, what happened at the Pentagon, which is not something that Port, the AE 9-11 Truth does. So it'll be good for you to actually see that. She, It's pretty intense stuff on the you, Pentagon. See you in one week. Yes. Wednesday, 8.30 in the morning regarding the Pentagon.